we have a talk on, that's right, progressive file layouts. Uh, this talk is going to be, uh, I guess, work by JH and JH. That's Jason Hill and John Hammond. Uh, <laughs> what is this, raising the roof? No, no I, I saw it and I was like, wow, you know, and made me think of that moment in the movie Brazil where he says, here I am, J.H. But anyway, um, so it's, it's uh, right. I think the coffee's starting to kick in. <laughs> right on. Uh, John Hammond. John L. Hammond, for that matter. I mean, distinguishing you from that other guy at Intel named John Hammond. Uh, he is a Lustre Core developer at Intel. He has been involved in the Lustre community since 2009. Prior to that, he received a PhD in mathematics from the University of Texas at Austin. Jason Hill from ORNL, Bon Vivant, Man About Town. He has been a Lustre administrator since 2007 at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Through the development of two Spider Center file, file systems, he and the team at ORNL have developed a significant amount of best practices around monitoring Lustre in a standards-based way. He's been involved heavily in the Lustre community and continues to be the pack lead for some of OpenSFS's development efforts for DNE2 and LFSCK. Hey, let's give it up and raise the roof for John Hammond and Jason Hill. Steve Sims, everybody. Uh, oh, I forgot, Steve. What's the what's the IU? It's the it's one, one two, two, three. three Four, five, yeah. Okay, that's that's Steve for everybody. Um, what a way to start the day. Uh, great preview by Andreas. So uh, we shouldn't uh, take too long before we uh, have to break into coffee and things like that. But I'm here to give a little bit of background about the pro progressive file system layout work that we're doing with Intel. And John's going to get into some of the the more technical details. Um, so a little bit of project overview: what progressive file layouts are. Andreas kind of give you a nice preview there, uh, talk about what our goals and use cases are for these, and then John will get into design and, and some future work. Um, so the effort here is, is a joint effort, and I should avoid turning without turning my body so the microphone's with me. Um, Mike Brim and Sarp Oral are the task leads for this at Oak Ridge National Lab. Sarp had to be back at Oak Ridge, otherwise he would be up here and, and not me. Um, several other people at Oak Ridge are, are working very hard on this. Uh, together, uh, and it's funded from ORNL directly. Um, so a layout, what is a layout, right? It's striping. It's what's your stripe count? What's the stripe width? How many objects do you need? Um, I, a lot of this is very self-descriptive here, but uh, the progressive layouts allow you to just go ahead and change that layout on the fly. Um, and that's a sort of an interesting thing so that you can store your very small files on a single OST and you can store your multi-terabyte files on lots of OSTs. Um, it's a, John correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's a user defined or it's a, a system administrator defined boundary um, with the possibility of eventually changing that to where users can define the boundaries. Which? No, it's users. Oh, users define the boundary, okay. Um, so we're trying to resolve this tension between, you know, a statically find, defined stripe where if I want to write a 4K file, I've got to, in Oak Ridge's production case, chew up four OSTs, each of them at one megabyte apiece, right? So you get wasted space, you get all the overhead of all these uh, system calls. Um, the small stripe counts give us a lot better performance for create stats and unlinks. Um, and uh, the large stripe counts give us a lot better I.O. performance uh, for, for the very, very large files. Um, if you have a large stripe count, you can start to see some issues with um, maybe out of space OSTs if you have imbalance in your file system. You can also start to see issues with um, performance, let's say, because uh, one OST is maybe being targeted by a specific user with a singly wide striped file, but they're writing multi terabytes. So you, you have some trade offs to look at. Um, using progressive layouts allows us to defer the stripe count. Uh, decision. It's not something that has to be done at file creation time. It's something that we can start to push out as we see the file grow or that you can make a decision if you happen to know the size of the file when you start to write it. Um, it also lets you do some things like um, 
a few years ago I heard uh, Jason Rapley from, at the time NASA, talk about a, a, a hybrid OST where you would slap together some amount of SSDs and some amount of SATA drives together and make it look like a unified target to Lustre. This gives you the ability to do that without having to do that extra hardware work of strapping it together. Um, and it can also help you avoid those out of space OSTs. And now it's John's turn. Thank you. So the, the way we do this is based on uh, the layout enhancement and we presented this at uh, LUG last year. Um, so one component of layout enhancement is a, a composite layout. So it takes traditional layout X adders and bundles them together. So we have a header, we have this many sub layouts and just stores that as a new X adder. So here's, here's a composite, here, here's the data view of a composite extent mapped file. So the first two megabytes uh, use, use a single uh, stripe, so that's a, a single object. Uh, the, the next is going from two megabytes to 256. We have four stripes and these are totally different objects from what we used in the first component. And then from 256 on we use 32 stripes. So we thought the file was going to be small, so we didn't use a lot of objects. It turned out it was going to be a little larger, so we tried some more, and then it turned out you know, the cat picture was even larger than we thought, so we went to 32 stripes, right? Uh, here's the layout sort of as a, a extended attribute. So this is what we store on the MDT so we can locate the, uh, to know the stripe count, size, which objects. So we have a fixed header, we have the number of components, so that's the same as the number of extents and the same as the number of uh, sub layouts. Each component has an ID, each component has an extent, that's the 2 to 256 megabytes. And then we just store the components as sort of uninterpreted data that gets unpacked and, and understood later. So Right, how do we specify this? So we need a new uh, variant of the set stripe IO control that just, uh, you know, you say what you want, you say how many stripes and what size, you specify the layout, and then you specify the extent. So you're, you're either creating the initial extent or you're tacking on a new extent. Um, in the implementation of the prototype, there'll, there'll be some I think fairly reasonable restrictions on on uh, the uh, the extents we use, and then we need to uh, extend LFS set stripe uh, and the and the libraries to uh, do these I/O controls for us. Uh, the client side LOV layer will unpack and interpret these composite layouts. And they'll understand that um, you know these files have extents now, and that as IOs come down, they need to be possibly broken up and dispatched into the separate components according to according to the extents. Uh, if you are trying to read or write into an area that you haven't mapped yet, so maybe you've just set up the first two megabytes, and then the application decides to seek out to 42 megabytes and write something or read something, it's going to return eno data. And, and the same with, uh, with truncate. So the use case, especially for, for the prototype, is going to be a, an application that is aware of these layouts, that knows what it's doing, and is going to restrain itself to working within the stuff it's already set up. So you'll create a, uh, a file with a, a composite layout with just a single component and you'll say what's that initial extent. So that's your new LFS set stripe and the begin and the end are the extent boundaries. Or there's the equivalent C, the pseudocode in the library. And now you're free to read and write 
into that first, the application can treat that first two megabytes just like it would normally. And then once it wants to go further, it needs to stop, create a new extent that's as far as it wants. I've used, I don't know, two megabytes and 256 sort of consistently. Uh, you know, I think in practice, the two megabytes is gonna be a, a lot, maybe a lot farther out, but um, so it's just giving itself more space, uh, more space in which to do IO. You know, and so on and so on. We have to beef up LFS get stripe so that we can see, you know, what, what is actually, how does this file look? And then we're just gonna do this by saying, well, these are the extents and then sort of recursing and you know, showing you the striping of each component, just like when you call L LFS get stripe on a, on a single file, a normal file. So um, it is a prototype that we're working on. It is uh, a bit manual in the way I described about the application needing to be aware of it, needing to uh, stop and do these IO controls. So I think the most obvious piece of future work is to have it automatically add new components as the application you know, creates a larger and larger file. Uh, we need ways for it to decide um, you know, what, if it's gonna, if it's gonna do it automatically, then it needs to make decisions about what stripe count to use for the next component and how big to make the next component. And that needs to be specified in some way that it can be tuned, controlled by administrators. So that would be like a layout hint, like the, um, the LOV X adder that we store on directories to specify the default striping for uh, files created in that directory. Um, or alternatively, uh, the application, when it creates the file initially, it could specify a template, which would be, you know, it would have extents and stripe counts, but it wouldn't have objects until those objects were needed, right? So you would have an extent and a stripe count for the for the first component, and that would have objects. But then only if you needed the next component would the objects actually be allocated. Oh, and just let me say that um, this, you know, it, it's a very interesting project, and what it's doing is it, it's allowing us to grow the LOV layer and the, the layouts in the direction of supporting things like replication, HSM partial restore. So we're building, I think, pretty big chunks of the infrastructure that, w that we'll need for that. So it's very interesting in, in that way too. And I hope we, we get it right for those future use cases. How are we on time? Pretty good. Yeah. Questions? Here. Yeah. Um, do you expect any interaction with the OSD pool if we have one? I mean, when you uh, when you create a new component, uh -huh. right? You can specify the pool to use for that component. So the first thing I thought about is if we have actually different OSD pools for the smaller files and then other uh, bigger files, then it feels like uh, you may, your progress for file layout actually has to go to the different OSD pools, which will be contradictory to what we, you, we usually expect. I, so I, uh, my I question is, file layout can be completely orthogonal to the OSD pool operation so that it stays in the, within the OSD pool? or do we have enough flexibility to change it? So I agree that pools are, will work very well with this, but I don't understand what you mean by the contradictory part. So for, you don't have to use a single pool for the file. You can use a different pool for each component, right? But that's supposed to be automated. 
which can be actually against what we designed it for. Because it's a, it's a clunky prototype, right? You know, you have to do these things. That, but when we have something like a template layout or a hint, then that uh, hint could say, use this pool for the first component, use this pool for the next. You know, it could be written into there, right? Okay. Sounds good. Thanks. So I was going to ask, um, and maybe I, I just wasn't catching it fully, but with say with LFS set stripe right now, you can do it per file, uh, per directory, or per file system. W would you be able to do something similar similar with this? Because yes, okay. So you could it set a per file system default uh, for, for yes. this. And, okay, because that I think for for most cases I've seen that that's usually sufficient because most users don't ever want to go and touch their own file layout so you have to be you have to do it for them right so, all right great Thanks for being here. <laughs> hey guys I just want to say I really like this and I think it was Mark said yesterday that uh, users won't change their IO patterns and we asked people what their or users what their IO patterns are they have no clue what we're even asking them. But to do it automatically, to have defaults on the file system makes complete sense. We know the file system as admins and developers set it up. And users just do their I.O. and the file system automatically tunes, essentially, for whatever they're doing. So I look forward to seeing this uh, in practice. There's one in the back. Oh, Nathan, too. Sorry. So I, as I understand how the current luster operates, if you're writing a file, OST fills up, you get an E no space back or something like that. If my application using your stuff would be smart enough to watch for the E no space, can he figure out which, will we be able to figure out which OST filled up so I can make a new allocation or you know, a new uh, extent structure? and continue on? So when you, uh, when you create the new extent, as long as you don't choose an OST index, you'll, you, when, the, uh, when the MDT chooses the objects for that new extent, it will use round robin QoS uh, to, to select the best OSTs for that, for that extent. Just like when you create a new file, the MDT, you know, the MDT will choose OSTs um, on which to place the objects for that file, and it will avoid the out of space OST. But with the 2.7 features where I can pick my own OSTs, I should be able to tweak all this stuff myself, right? Yes. Yes. So, assuming I can so find out on the fly what OST you filled can, up. You can specify it as, as uh, specifically as you want, right? You can give it a, you can, you can uh, give a list of OST indexes. Or you can let the MDT choose by just specifying the stripe count and the stripe size and, and you can let it, and then you get round robin QoS and the other way you know what you're doing or you don't, right? Okay, thank you. Uh, so this layout will kind of fundamentally have an uneven loading pattern on the OSTs, right? So it's not going to result in, in even uh, access patterns for any one individual file. You're, you're heavily loading the front end OSTs with additional RPCs basically from, mul from more But from you're more still clients, using right? but, all but the don't OSTs read it so many times. Hmm? I said, but don't read the front end so many times, right? No, it, it's you're not... I'm, I'm saying you're, you're having... 256 so, so you, to infinity have, is much if, bigger than... I understand, but if you're, you're having uh, a large number of clients um, all accessing uh, in a, a, a single shared file, for instance, yes. right? This is the point of this. Um, you're having a large number of clients all accessing uh, presumably uh, you know, every megabyte of the file. Um, what you're going to end up with is more OSTs accessing the front, the, the front loaded uh, more clients accessing front, the front end OSTs, right? The, the two, the, whatever, the first two megabyte OSTs and the, and the 
four megabyte OSTs. Right, but you're going to have more, more clients accessing those. So those OSTs are going to be more heavily loaded for that one individual file. But this is not different than, than what we have now, right? Because the first megabyte of, the, you know, before PFL, the first megabyte of the file lives on one OST, right? So if your application is hot in that first megabyte, then you overload that OST. So yeah. in but, this way, you're, I'm, I'm it's the same. For a completely even, even, even loading, right, of, of, of every access. So you're going to have the, the ones at the back are going to be rarely used. I mean, they'll be used on a, you know, say a one-to-one -one client to OST ratio. The ones on the front are going to be used multiple clients to, to a single OST. So, so, so at the front, it's, it's as bad as it was before, and at the back, it's better than before. And it just depends on your I.O. pattern whether, you know, this makes you happy or, or not. I, I'm just saying, so th this, this is not a, a, a universal optimization. This is an optimization for one particular case. No. Right. So one of, one of the prototype codes is actually a code where each process reads a different segment in the file. So we avoid that uneven loading. But yeah, I mean, as, as John said, it's no worse, I think, than yeah. it is today. I mean, what, what's important to note is that the, the number of stripes and the number of segments and things is completely arbitrary. I mean, you can create um, a, a PFL layout that has one megabyte for the first component as three you know, stripes for the next four components. It has, you know, 12 stripes for the next, you know, 16 megabytes. You can make it simulate exactly um, a, a fully striped file with the same number of OSTs per segment, and you get the same loading on any individual OST. It just depends on how you specify the file, right? If you want, you know, if your common case is small files are you know 32 megabytes and they're all accessed by single clients then you can specify you know a layout that that matches those kind of workloads i mean you can set up a default one that makes most people happy but there's no limitation on how individual users you know specify they don't even have to have um you know an increasing stripe count if you have hdf files or something weird you can have more stripes at the beginning and fewer at the end or whatever, it's, it's up to the users to get it. Will you be able to, um, off. Will you be able to Is it working? Hello? There we go. Um, can you um, rewrite the uh, layouts, or, or do you have to copy the file to do something like that? Uh, initially, though, there won't be support for re-extending a, uh, a layout, right? I mean, I think there's very interesting things you could do. You could do there, like, you know, if you knew the file was, if, if you felt like you'd gotten to the, you'd written the file, right, and, y and you're done writing, and it was turned out to be huge, then you might have these, these small extents that you wrote originally, and maybe they could be flattened onto the last extent. And you could just have a, you know, 32 stripe file. But that's, that's all in the future, right? Have you guys uh, thought about how this is going to interoperate with data on MDT? Well, people have asked me that question a lot, but I haven't really thought about it yet. Okay. Yeah. I'm just one of many, I guess. Yeah. You'll have that. Yeah. Well, we're thinking about it. Yeah. Cool. Anybody else? Well, thank you both. Thanks. JH and JH.